Well, welcome everyone to Talks at Google. We have a very special guest today, which is Dr. Susan Murphy. Uh, Susan is a professor of statistics and psychiatry at the University of Michigan. She's been doing research on developing uh, wearable mobile devices in the healthcare industry. Um, she's also received some amazing awards, including a, a fellow, <clears throat> well, this one actually is pretty impressive. The fellowship from, as a MacArthur Fellow in 2013 uh, received 600, over $600,000 no strings attached grant uh, to do research because she's shown exceptional creativity and promised to do more. She's working on projects that are helping a lot of people, which we'll hear about today. Uh, so thanks for joining us. I'll turn the time over now to Susan. Thanks, Mark. Okay, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, so uh, you can see from this first slide that uh, this is about mobile health, and I've been really fortunate. I'm part of um, multiple groups that work in mobile health. Um, so the, here I have my little pictures, one on at physical activity. We also have some work in smoking cessation right now, in alcoholism, drug abuse, uh, also... Um, congestive heart failure as well, and uh, that involves most of these different groups. And I'll, today we're going to spend most of our time, when I talk about an example, I'll talk about the physical activity study. So what I'm going to do here is, uh, I, uh, even as a quantitative person, it's really important to be careful about what are all the parts of a, a project or a, an entity that you're building. In this case, it's a mobile health intervention. And you have to think, what are all the parts? So that you can think of each part and then how to optimize that part. And so that's what I'm going to go through first. So it's going to all be very verbal, but I'm talking, because one needs to think about each one of these parts to optimize. So this is adaptive interventions. Adaptive interventions, that's a name of a design that the mobile health interventions fit within that uh, name. And the idea is these are intervention, interventions where you want to tailor the intervention to the person. Um, one thinks that there may be systematic reasons why people respond differently. And to the extent that you can use those systematic reasons to personalize treatment, you'd like to do that. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you an old, uh, older example, and the reason why I'm showing this to you is uh, it's very simple. It doesn't involve mobile health, but it helps uh, really communicate the ideas. And uh, it's what's, for me, very interesting is that we, in the mobile health field, we forget, in the health field in general, we forget that a lot of what we do um, has a lot of relevance for social problems and social issue programs and this really gets at that so this is a an adaptive drug court program for drug abusing offenders so what happens is you get arrested and you're offered uh, the opportunity to uh, bypass jail and go into a drug court program if uh, and that's what we're talking about individuals who had that opportunity and what happens is these individuals come in and uh, this is a study that went on in uh, Philly actually. Uh, and I was a consultant on this study and they wanted to develop an adaptive intervention which they call the adaptive drug court program. This is a big coup actually because this is working with the judicial system which is non-trivial. Are we able to ask questions? I think it would be nice. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah. Um, in a program like this, so uh -huh. Mark had talked about your research receiving funds from uh -huh. grants. Uh -huh. Is this Yeah, right. This is a good question. So he asked me, how do um, these types of projects get funded? And in the world I live in, for the most part, we're always interested in edgy kind of uh, projects. So they tend to be funded by NIH or foundations, like the Ford Foundation or some other foundation. Uh, Autism Speaks has funded some of our work, for example. Um, you also see work fund, funded by industry as well. Every now and then, little bitty bits will get funded by the university, but that's not really where the money is. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it uh, alleviates then the court systems or taxpayers for paying for some of these. 
Oh yeah, the taxpayers, they were paying for it, but not through the judicial system. It was via a research project that was funded by the National Institutes of Health. So, um, so what, and the whole goal was to figure out, can we produce a, a good program? So people were classified, you, what you see is a decision tree here, and you can think of the most adaptive interventions as akin to decision trees. Uh, people were classified into low risk or high risk. This is a diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder uh, or formal drug abuse treatment. They're brought in, they're provided uh, standard group-based drug abuse counseling, and they're provided uh, two different options of a very expensive intervention, ju judicial supervision. So that's where the game is here, the expense of judicial supervision. Can you reduce that? And can you only step it up if you need to? Every month they're monitored, and at the end of each month they can be doing well. Everything's fine. Or they might be non-compliant. That means they're not following the rules of the pr drug court program. Um, they're not showing up for enough drug abuse sessions two or more, or they're not providing urine screens every week. This, um, if they're non-compliant, the judicial supervision is stepped up at the end of that month. Uh, if they're doing well, nothing happens. They just stay in the same thing. If they're non-responsive, that's someone who's really trying hard, but they're providing positive urine screens, more than two. And then you don't want to up, up the judicial supervision. Instead, you want to increase the uh, support for drug abuse therapy. And so they move to what's called intensive case management. This includes um, individual based uh, therapy and a lot of different supportive services. The whole goal of this project was to help people graduate from the drug uh, program as opposed to going back into jail, which is a very expensive intervention. <laughs> okay. So this is an adaptive intervention, and it has these elements that one really needs to think about when you think about forming one of these interventions. So there's always some sort of distal outcome. In this case, it was getting pe helping people graduate from the drug abuse program. You can imagine in other settings that, that distal outcome might be a trade-off between cost and benefit. Um, there's always a proximal response here. In our case, the proximal response was whether or not you were compliant each month or you were responsive, whether or not you had positive urines. Um, so that's what we're, we're looking or We're looking to see how you're responding, compliance or responsive. And then the decision tree is formed by what people in this field call tailoring variables. Those are the variables we use to make decisions. In our case, they are, in fact, the same as the proximal response. Uh, the decision rules, which is that little decision tree, the kinds of treatments we ha we're ready, we're able to provide, levels of judicial supervision, levels of drug abuse therapy. And then you trigger, you have to think about when you're going to trigger these decision rules. And then a drug abuse program, it was monthly, so at very coarse intervals in time. And you, and it, all of this has to be thought carefully about if you want to get something that's both cost-effective and uh, effective. So let's go to a mobile, more of a mobile setting. So um, here we, um, the people call these just-in-time adaptive interventions to uh, communicate the fact that you're trying to intervene at the time in the moment where a person really can use help at 2 a.m. in the stairwell, delivered when needed, wherever needed. So here's a really simple example that I like. <laughs> it's highly simplistic. Nowadays, things have gotten much more sophisticated. And this is where you have software that's monitoring your, your mouse activity as well as your um, keyboard activity on the computer. You're an office worker. And if you go 30 minutes with uninterrupted activity, you get a ping and it suggests that you stand up and walk around the room. Actually, there's a variety of different kinds of messages and they had the messages compete with each other to see which one would be best for you in what setting. Um, so uh, we're gonna be talking about this in the mobile health setting. This is not mobile, but it is just in time. It has that connotation. So what's, what's common about adaptive interventions in these uh, 
just-in-time adaptive interventions is they, they're time-varying treatments, right? You see treatments changing over time. The idea is you're going to adapt the treatment to the individual. You're going to personalize the treatment in some way. Um, however, in our just-in-time uh, intervention, it's technology-based. It's really focused. And indeed, often you want access to wearables, sensor streams, and so on. You want to be able to uh, for, uh, collect information wherever it's needed so that you get the right kind of tailoring variable so you know what to do. You, know, you can identify moments of opportunity, moments of risk. And you want to be able to deliver interventions in the real life of the person. So it's the exact same game as before. The components are the exact same. There's nothing spectacularly new here. It's just that everything becomes more in the moment. At first, I used, I used to say momentary, but one is not, I don't want to uh, give you the impression that the effects might be fleeting, right? But they're in the moment. So I'm trying to help you if you're craving right now. I'm trying to help you be active right now. And the decision points are real time. And what I'm going to do on the next couple of slides is I'm going to go through each one of these. And it turns out right now the state of the field in mobile health, it's pretty immature. And this makes it really exciting for scientists and technology developers because most of this we haven't, we don't have good, we don't really know how to optimize yet. We know that we got problems, we know what, where we need to go, but we haven't gotten it straight in our head how to optimize it. Okay, so we're going to start off um, by the distal outcome. So the distal outcome is some long-term goal that you want to achieve. And uh, in the world I live in, which is more on the uh, research, more research side, it usually is some sort of clinical outcome, like I'm trying to delay the time to relapse in substance use. I'm trying to reduce the r rate at which people binge eat. Uh, I'm trying to keep people uh, from drinking heavily, binge drinking, and so on. Or in a lot of areas, maintain adherence to medications. It's very common. The whole idea here is you formulate your intervention options, the interventions that you might provide, so that you'll uh, affect these proximal responses and thus achieve your distal outcome. So if in the behavioral science world, this fits in very well with the way the theoretical, the, the theories in, with which they guide their thinking. So proximal response are called, they're often called mediators. I don't know if y'all would have heard those words, mediators. They're used a lot in the behavioral sciences. And if you think of a causes B, and then B causes C. B is the mediator. A doesn't cause C directly. It causes B, and then B causes C. So there's this causal chain that you want to impact. So here I've given some examples of what the proximal response might be. Uh, substance use over the near time, if you're interested in reducing relapse. A physical activity, if you're trying to help people who want to uh, be less obese, uh, medication adherence over the next time. Often, so this is the same as the short-term targeted behavior. The distal outcome is a behavior, the proximal response is a behavior. Uh, in other settings, uh, it's some measure of short-term risk. So for example, in smoking cessation, um, one of the big determinants of why people tend to relapse is having problems with stress management because smoking is used to help you manage stress. And so stress would be a classical kind of mediator that you might want to impact. And the last one, this is something that we in the mobile health field have just, uh, we're really starting to realize how absolutely critical it is. And I think someone in business would, realize, would have realized this maybe even earlier, is engagement. So if you're dealing with a problem which is chronic, like, um, for example, substance use, being physically active, eating well, managing your stress. This is something you have to deal with for long periods of time. If we don't keep you engaged, when things start to go downhill, that app will not be there for you. So uh, engagement could be another um, type of proximal response. The kinds of intervention options, this too is very 
It's quite interesting. Um, I didn't realize there were so many, but it's a vast array of different kinds of ways that we can try and help people. Uh, ways to reframe a relapse, uh, alternative activities to help me deal with craving for a cigarette. Uh, maybe there's different interventions, uh, little interventions that are on the, f on the phone, residing on my smartphone, yet I don't think when I should access them because I'm not s so self-aware, you know, I'm so stressed out, I'm not that aware right now. So it might be a nudge to access an intervention that I can uh, obtain on the phone. Self-monitoring, prompt me to record my diet or something of that type. And of course there's the provide nothing option, which actually is one of the most best options of all because if you, I don't know how y'all are, but my smartphone and me, we stay together all the time. You know, when I take a shower, my smartphone is on the sink. When I go to bed, my smartphone is next. I mean, me and my smartphone, we're together all the time. And so the, pro, the, uh, the issue of burden and aggravation is profound in this domain. It's much more profound than in any other area of health I know of in terms of just aggravation to the person. So the provide nothing option is, of course, a good one. So tailoring variables. These are the variables you use to decide whether or not to uh, provide a push or support. Uh, often they are present response. Uh, proximal responses you've already observed, uh, whether or not you're uh, going into a risky period. Uh, like if I want to suggest that you might go and go for a walk or somehow break your sedentary behavior, I might want to look uh, at the busyness of your Google Calendar over the next couple of hours because it might not be worth it to suggest you go for a walk if you're going straight into a whole series of meetings so on. And of course adherence too might be if you're showing signs that you're becoming uh, more aggravated with the intervention, maybe I need to back off. The phone should back off, the algorithm should back off in them. So these are all uh, tailoring, could be tailoring variables. Um, decision points, these are the time points at which you have to decide whether or not you might uh, intervene. Um, so this is, this is complicated and it's something that we really don't have quite straight in the science because it's tailored to the dynamics of whatever process you're trying to impact. So with stress, for example, we don't really understand how volatile stress might be for people who are trying to quit smoking. How volatile is it in a dynamic way over the day? So how often might we want to intervene during the day? That's not very clear. Uh, in the smoking cessation study, we decided, I'm not going to talk about that study here, but we're, we have decision points at every minute because we don't know yet how volatile it is, so we picked the smallest time at which we could get classifications of stress. Also, the intervention may only have an impact over a short period of time, and that'll inform. Uh, the decision rules, so these can be decision rules like a decision tree, like I showed you before, except in more of a real-time kind of setting. Uh, they can be if-then kind of rules. Uh, in some settings, they're black box type rules that just, it's an output of a, an algorithm. If you go to the behavioral sciences and you go to the research field, most people hand tailor, hand tune the decision rules. There's some indirect use of data, but for the large part, people hand tune it. And so what this talk from now on is going to be about is how we might collect data so that we could use data to inform that tuning of these decision rules. Oh, here's just an example in the case of the sedentary computer behavior of a decision rule in the if-then framework rather as opposed to a decision tree. Just thought I'd give you an example. So here's my tailoring variable. Here's an intervention option. We have a threshold on the tailoring variable. So we might want to learn with data what the best threshold might be. And that threshold might vary by person, right? Because my tolerance of being uh, pinged might be lower than someone else's. So you might have to have a higher threshold for me than someone else. Or in this particular setting, whatever's going on today may mean my threshold for top being pinged is lower. Okay, so here's the summary. Um, I'm just going to skip this, but it's a summary of the way behavioral scientists might think about when they think about forming one of these interventions. 
So I want to go on to heart steps. Heart steps is a study. It just, well, it's a, actually it's a set. This is one of these studies. It's uh, funded by uh, the National Institutes of Health. And it's a study that involves three different um, uh, trials. And the first trial, uh, the last two trials would be with individuals who had a heart attack and were trying to help them stay active after the heart attack to prevent future cardiovascular problems. The first study is just for sedentary people because we're trying, uh, if you've ever worked a lot with te technology, there's really a lot of bugs you've got to deal with in this setting. So uh, that's heart steps, and that's what we're going to talk about next. So heart steps, uh, what it involves is in, in the current, the, the first of the three studies we use is a jawbone uh, on the wrist to get a uh, step count as well as, well as sleep quality. And we, had, we built a little app on the phone. And of course, this app has a lot of uh, supportive stuff that uh, is involved in that app, but I'm going to focus on only certain aspects. So the distal outcome, it was a 42-day study, and in this particular case, we were looking to increase the sedentary individual's activity over the duration of the 42 days. And what, but however, the way we wanted to do this is we wanted to provide them actionable suggestions that when I say actionable, this means you need to have sense, you need to know what context they're in at that moment. Actionable suggestions they could use to be less sedentary in that moment. And so the re proximal response is going to be some measure, in this case step count, of their activity following a decision point. And at, uh, at a decision point, we, may, uh, we, we, we could give different kinds of messages. In fact, here, uh, it turns out we had three options. We wouldn't bother you at all at a decision point. Or we would give you uh, one of two varieties of an activity recommendation. One is um, an activity recommendation that's just aimed at uh, reducing sedentary behavior. For example, I got one in the office one day in the midday, and it suggested I stand up and roll my arms. It was actually very actionable. I, I liked it. But others are about going for a walk, like a 10-minute walk. So that's much more onerous for me. I mean, I really need to be in the right setting to be able to act on that. The decision times were every two to two and a half hours. And you might ask why. And in fact, we spent a lot of time trying to get that straight in our head. We were lucky it's, this is part of a big team. And a, uh, 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 a group of us on this team had access to large amounts of jawbone data. And they looked to see. Uh, when was the most variance in activity in people's lives? So if there's a lot of variance at that time, there's the potential to increase their activity because there is times at which they would, they would be active sometimes at those times. And it turned out these were five times a day um, right before you went to work, pre-morning commute, around midday, mid-afternoon, around when you're leaving work and in the evening. And those, that's about every two to two and a half hours, so five times a day. So originally, we were going to do it much more frequently. But once we looked at the data, it was very clear this is when you saw that variance, this potential to have an impact. Um, so how might a recommendation look? And I'm going to focus on no message versus a message here. And I got this message. I think it, uh, this was uh, last year. It was uh, absolutely frigid. It was wonderful. Actually, it was a beautiful day. It was sunny, uh, March 14th. It was on a Saturday. So it's going to only give me a message which makes sense on a Saturday. It won't give me a message about work, for example, because I'm not at work. And it actually, and um, it was in the middle of the day. So here it suggested that I try and make a warm treat and maybe do some jumping jacks, move around a lot while, while it's working. Um, these uh, suggestions are tailored to the day of the week, the time of the day, the weather outside, for example, if it's absolutely nasty weather outside, we're not going to suggest that you go for a walk outside. Uh, the other week, I can't remember what else they might, it was, it was four different kinds of ways they were tailored to the context. And when I get this, set, this, is on my no, this is a notification on your phone, and when I get this notification, I have three ways to swipe it off. I can press thumbs down. It wasn't useful for me. I can press thumbs up. I liked it. And it goes away then. Or I can press this button in the middle. If I press the button in the middle, I turn off the intervention. 
So like I could, if I know that I'm going to be busy, for example, I could turn off the intervention for the next four hours. So I have control. I, the user, have control. This is nice. Okay. Right, so we're using Google a lot, as you can well imagine. So uh, we have, uh, so I'm going to talk about that in the next slide. Okay, so we, uh, we're, you. no, no, it's perfect. Uh, so um, the, we're using the Google activity recognition, uh, recognition here. Um, for example, uh, and you'll see why, but we, have, I use, we use the information on the phone as to whether or not you're moving really fast. You could be driving, for example, whether or not you're currently walking and so on. Um, and then we also have the weather. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure where we pull that from because that's not specific to that individual, right? That's just specific to that location. Uh, and then we also look at their Google Calendar, actually, and classify whether or not the Google Calendar looks busy or not, uh, and so on. And then the jawbone, we get the step count from the jawbone. Okay, I just want to talk to you about the trial we ran because this was the study. We wanted to design it. Actually, it turns out there were all kinds of decision rules we want to form. There were other interventions we were thinking about, but I just focused on this one activity recommendation up to five times a day. So we ran this study, and we, we've developed this study called a micro-randomized trial to, to investigate whether or not these activity recommendations are working as designed. So in these uh, trials, what happens is each participant is randomized at each decision time. So in the case of heart steps, um, it's a 42-day study. There's five times a day, so there's 210. So each person is randomized 210 times over the course of the study. And the smoking, we're involved in a smoking cessation study. There it's every minute, um, 10 hours a day, uh, 10 days, so around 6,000 times or so. Um, so you can be randomized a great deal. Of course, most of the time you're going to be randomized to nothing. Right? Um, so uh, the thing I want to point out these are these two points here before. Uh, in the scientific literature, these are these might be uh, these are akin to full factorial trials, designs, experimental designs, and the, that sends a lot of signals. And one signal it sends is that you're, you you want to collect data to de develop. A, pro, a strategy, a mobile health intervention. You're not collecting data to confirm that one mobile health intervention is better, some, one package is better than another. Instead, you're trying to develop a mobile health intervention pa a package. Uh, and it's, it can also be viewed, I think some of y'all will be familiar with A-B testing. It's commonly used throughout the advertising world to decide where we're going to place ads on the websites and so on. Um, and that this generally is with a between person randomization. You know, every time someone goes to the website, the placements are randomized, and, we're try and we have some contextual information on them, and we're trying to figure out where to place an ad based on that contextual information. So it's an A-B testing. And then single case designs, these are used a lot in the behavioral field. And this is where generally most of the randomization is with in person randomization. Uh, so what happens when you get something versus what happens when you don't get it? And this is a combination. It extends both of these. Uh, it uses them in different ways from the way they're normally used, but it, the design itself is, looks similar to a combination of these two. So we're going to have multiple people. Each per, they'll be randomized across people and within person. Uh, and one other thing I just wanted to make a statement about, uh, if you're used to uh, obtaining large data sets, this is clear now, particularly in the business, um, among, in the business community. Um, but for a long time, a lot of us thought, well, look, just give me tons of data uh, tracking, say, uh, how people are accessing an intervention, and I'll use my algorithms and tell you whether or not the intervention is working. And we now, we understand better and better that this is not the way you want, this is not the best way to discover if an intervention is working because the reasons why someone accesses an intervention may be strongly related to how they uh, behave following receipt of that intervention. And so you don't know if the intervention caused that behavior or the reasons why they access the intervention are related to that behavior. And so randomization breaks that. 
so that we can just see whether or not the intervention uh, causes the behavior. As, uh, and that's why you see so much randomization now, both in the business community as well as in the health field. So in hard steps, um, we're in this simplified aspect of hard steps. Hard steps, we're only looking to know whether or not we should provide a tailored activity recommendation uh, at these five decision times per day, 42 days, 210. And what we did was uh, we randomized two-fifths, three-fifths. And uh, you might ask why, uh, if you have had any, you know, like in statistics in school, you would know that we would normally use one-half randomization. It gives you highest power to detect a signal. The issue here is burden. If you ping people too much and suggest they do things, they may start to habituate and ignore you. So we only wanted, on average, two suggestions per day originally. So we used five, five occasions, two-fifths. Um, the first question uh, we wanted to ask was, do these activity suggestions have any impact? And then we would ask whether or not the context m affected the impact of those suggestions. And so what we do is we test for main effects. So uh, I'm concerned because it's 107 right now. And how much time do you think I have? We started a little bit late, but I, th I think we should still. Oh, OK. I just want to make sure. Thanks. Uh, so what we're going to do here is, so we're trying to figure out how to design this study. So when you say design, uh, we already talked about we have five decision points. We're going to randomize people to getting a suggestion at each of those decision points. That seems all kind of clear. The question is, how many people do we have to recruit? And that's ha that has cost considerations when you're trying to fund a trial like this, because it takes time to, if you're talking about human subjects, uh, it takes time to recruit these people, uh, enroll them, and, so, and monitor. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, how many subjects do we need in order to test whether or not there's a signal at all of these activity suggestions? Does it have any impact on you? So there's two things that come up that I think are really cool here. Uh, and these two considerations make these types of problems in mobile health completely different from what you see across the health field when you're talking about medications or different kinds of physical therapies and so on. And here's the first, and I'll talk to you about the second after this. So the first is that uh, this is an intervention that's occurring in the context of your life, right? It's right on your hip that your phone can ping you and, and intervene. So there's this potential, as I mentioned early, for burden can be very burdensome. And in particular, the, there's a potential for habituation. And habituation I'm using in a very negative sense here. That is, when people habituate to a message in a negative way, they don't even see it after a while. It's just not even there. You and I are habituating to all kinds of things. It allows us to be productive. <coughs> we just don't even see these issues. You don't hear about the noise outside and so on. And so to the extent people start to habituate, we'll lose effect. So we're not, we can't uh, anticipate that the effect early in the study might be the same as the effect later in the study. Because by then, they may have habituated to these messages. Now, we do have hundreds and hundreds of messages we can provide. And they are tailored to the context. But nonetheless, you may still habituate. So um, and if you get aggravated, you may just start ignoring them. So what we're going to do is when we talk about the signal, we're going to have to, or the, what we call a main effect, that's the signal, the effect of the intervention, the message on your activity. So what's my activity look like if I get a message versus what's my activity look like if I don't get a message? Um, we're going to allow that to vary with time. The other thing we have to think about, and this is also related, this is very special to mobile health. Um, is this issue of availability. And this is something um, only recently have we in the research community really began to appreciate. And it's, it's really important. It's gonna, I think it's going to be a dominant issue going forward. And that is we, you cannot provide an intervention to someone when they're not available. So for example, in hard steps, if the Google classifier indicated that you might be driving a car, 
we would not have the phone light up, ping, and possibly interrupt you and prevent you from paying attention to the road. We just wouldn't do that. Also, if the Google classifier that's on the phone indicated that you're currently walking, we didn't want the phone to ping, audibly ping, light up and suggest that you go for a walk. It just, that would just be so aggravating. So you're not available at that time. The other way you might not be available is if you don't want to be bothered, right? So you have turned off the intervention. You've said, don't bother me. So for example, like I, I had days where I knew I was going to go to, from one, I was going to in a, uh, review meetings all day, I would turn off the intervention for the whole day. Those are times when I'm not available. So when, you t when we talk about the signal, or the, what I call the main effect, and we say it's time varying, it's not only that it's time varying because of burden and habituation, it's, it also, the, the, p the, si the signal at time 30 is only among the people who are available at time 30. So at each point in time, the population among whom I'm going to ask if, if there's an effect is a different group of people. Could be a slightly different group of people, yeah. Um, so, Mark, do you want me to ask this? Oh. So do you find, because you can track when somebody is, say, walking, mm -hmm. that if you were to give a message of support, so congrats, you're out walking, whatever that looks like, hard stuff, that you can reduce habituation over the 42 days so that at the end of the trial, yeah. It's uh, you know, it's less variance versus people who start, or do you not measure support? In in heart in heart uh, heart steps we're not. But right now I told you we were involved with an app challenge because we're very interested in so there's therapeutic interventions, that's what we're talking about today, right? They're therapeutic because these are people who are sedentary and we're trying to prevent bad health outcomes. There's also engagement interventions, and that's what you're talking about. How can I you know, make them more engaged with my intervention. And we are working exactly on those kinds of problems. How do we feedback, give them encouraging messages? They're currently doing something that's good for them. How do we help them feel good about this whole? And we're working on that now. And there's a lot of interest in having both just-in-time adaptive interventions that both have engagement or uh, reinforcers. The interventions themselves are reinforcers as well as therapeutic in some sense. They're, yeah. I mean, this is a big deal. And I personally think that latter is, the reinforcers are going to be even more important. And if we can keep you engaged long term, we have the potential to help you long term. Yeah, I would just wonder the impact on habituation and burden on future messaging. That's the whole game. That is the whole game. So, right, I don't we, don't, we haven't run a study where we know what that impact is, but we hope that it would be good. And so we're designing studies to right. test human this. Studies or human right. Nature, what you think, yes. You would think. You would think. You've got to be careful. Tell right. Us. Right. Um, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, um, at this point, there are a lot of apps out there, right? Like Fitbit yeah. Their own app, and um, they use this engagement model. In the right. Community, right? Build the community. Yeah, right, a lot of social, social sort of right, competitions. When, yeah, when you think about this and when this research is going, how are you thinking about it different from what's already out there? What's popular, what isn't? Right. Got like 20 variables now, they all tag into, uh, you know, an app uh, which adds to the yeah. network rather than then, later, whatever. Right. So how, do you, how do you, A, see all of your study to be different? Do you even see it as different? Oh, I can tell you. It. Yeah, okay. That's cool. So, um, we're, uh, so there are a lot, there are groups uh, that are very interested in um, pushing the research boundaries, not only having a commercially viable product, but also pushing our understanding of behavior science you know, the boundaries of behavior science. There are commercial groups that are doing this. Um, I think uh, Microsoft has a health arm. Uh, Google DeepMind has some interest in this. So there is, but by and large, mostly in the commercial world, there is a, you're looking for a commercially viable app. And the, that, uh, that 
may just mean that we need people to engage for a month and then it's commercially viable, right? So in our world though, in the world we're in, we're, we're both interested in pushing the boundaries of behavioral science as well as uh, having a health impact. So whatever, we really want to take apart these black boxes and understand what parts of the intervention really work the way we intended them to do and can we test the way our understanding of behavior, can we test it and, and further develop it? So habituation is a big player in this game. And in fact, you, you, as you, you may already know, most health apps that you can download, the attrition to health apps is profound. It's really bad. It's like within two months, 75% of people don't even use them. It's a big problem. But commercially, that may be fine. Right? It just depends on what your commercial objective is. Yeah, I guess my question was also in the lines of, since that happens uh, in the scope of your research, uh, how do you sort of you know, implement that? And how can you right. get some research points that actually help people continue with a certain app rather than keep moving? Right, and right. And so, so that's why we look at that micro, that's the whole purpose of these micro-randomized studies. Is the intervention working in, which we, in the way in which we designed it? We designed it to have an in-the-moment impact on you. Did it? Did the social networking have an in-the-moment impact? Did the gaming, like often there's interventions which are, um, have a game-like structure? Some people, and so, at some times, that may not work. We want to really understand that. And I'm not saying, I, I actually am working with a number of startups, and they want to answer those questions as well. But we do too, um, and we want to help the behavioral theory, develop behavioral theory so that we can come up and think of even more innovative interventions, both engagement as well as therapeutic, actually. Yeah, Susan, I have a question for uh -huh. you. Uh, what's your vision that really motivates you to do this research? Yeah, is there a this is a good question. You want to stop smoking or what would no, you my vision, I, no, I'm a data scientist, okay? Let's be honest about what my vision is. Okay, my vision is what we're gonna do is we're gonna use, I'm gonna really get off track here, okay? Just please forgive me, all those guys on the thing. Uh, so we're gonna use these micro-randomized trials. We test if there's a signal. Then what we'll do is we're, use, we're developing methods and we're uh, to um, develop what we call warm start just-in-time adaptive interventions. That is, these are uh, adaptive interventions that we use that, that data to try and get those decision rules pinned down. Then in our last study, for example, in Heart Steps, in our last study, we'll start everyone off on the warm start. And then we're going to have algorithms that run locally on the phone. So they have to be computationally efficient. Uh, less so as time goes on, but you know what I mean. But anyway, right now, and uh, they will personalize those decision rules to, to each one of us. Uh, and we want to personalize the, the, so this is a field of health. We have to be really careful. This is very different from personalizing ads. Um, we don't want to have any, we want to really avoid iterogenic effects. We don't want to disillusion you if you're trying, say you're someone who's trying to control your binge eating. We don't want you to become disillusioned. I mean, we really have to worry about, um, in our experimentation, we have to be concerned about having bad effects. So, so um, when we develop these algorithms that will personalize the intervention to you, we have to also monitor them the whole time. Um, so. Uh, let me just make it a little bit more uh, uh, clear. Remember in the, the example of that decision rule, I said that there was this threshold for how long you've been working on the computer, and that threshold may differ from person to person. Mine may be 30 minutes, Mark's may be an hour, and it may differ on what my calendar looks like. It may di differ by all kinds of things that are going on in my life. Right. So. Um, we, uh, that threshold, we want to, we can start at the beginning of the study, it would be something pretty simple. Mark's male, I'm female, maybe we have different thresholds because we're, one's male, one's female. He has, he works in one kind of job, I work in a totally different job, maybe we have different thresholds for that reason. 
But then, like, if you get two people like me, both female, we both have the same sort of job, there may be way, as watching me through time, we may learn that I respond to that intervention, those suggestions to get up and move differently than the other person. And that's what the algorithms will do. And that's my long-term goal, is to have really cool algorithms that do that. So, of course, I want to help my colleagues. I'm part of big teams with behavioral scientists, computer scientists, and I want them to advance their science as well. And to the extent that they advance their science, and I advance my science, and that we can work with the, we have startups that we're working with, to the extent that we can help them be more effective, everything gets better, right? I can advance my science too, right? Yeah, so that's the long-term goal. Now I got way off track. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, I think, so I just want to, I think I'm just going to show you this picture. I, I just want to harp on that little availability issue a little bit more because it's something that I, I, we just really didn't understand in mobile health until recently. So like here I've just drawn in a very cartoonish fashion what the effect of having a suggestion versus not having a suggestion might look like. So I have 210 decision points in hard steps. This is the difference between, it's a standardized difference, so it's a signal to noise ratio of, uh, in, your, in terms of your activity, getting a suggestion versus not. So you can imagine people may come in, so this is highly simplistic, like I said, because you can imagine it probably di varies by day of the week, time of the day, and so on, weather. But anyhow, at the beginning, there's not much going on because you just started getting these suggestions. You don't know how to make use of them. You don't even notice them at first. And then you start trying them out when you get them. You don't try anything out when you don't. So you see an effect increase. Then habituation comes in. I get tired of them. And I stop paying attention. And so you don't see any effect of a message on me. That's one reason why you might see this kind of curvilinear relationship with a decreasing effect. Another reason, though, you might see a changing signal over time, and we really need to understand that and somehow bring that into the theory, is that the group of people who are available to be intervened on varies with time. So there's going to be one group of people that have really bought, drank this Kool-Aid, right? They started walking most of those times or moving at those five times because they, you know, they really want to get get with the game. So they're not going to be available. We're not going to be looking at the effect of those people as time goes on. So you could, so it could be that the people are still available or the less, somehow they're not as receptive or the suggestions just don't have the same meaning for them. You know? So you might get a decrease because you have a different population on which you're looking. Very interesting. And the way in which you do science when your population is changing over time is different. It's not something we've done before. And, in most areas of experimentation. Across all areas of experimentation, we don't normally have this. It's, it's an area that just comes up mainly in mobile and wearables. Uh, okay, I just want to show you some sample sizes. Uh, and this, if you know about, um, okay, these are combinations of A-B studies and single case studies. And uh, the minute you know that, you know that when you decide, when you try and assess whether or not you have a treatment effect, you're going to compare both uh, Mark and I are in the study. He got a message, I didn't. You'll compare whether or not he was more active than me between person comparison. That's the A-B part. Also though, as I go through the study, you'll see me sometimes get a message, sometimes don't. Same for Mark. And you'll compare me both sometimes when I get it and sometimes when I don't. So that's a within person contrast. And so the minute you have both between and within person contrast, that means you don't need as big a number of participants in your study. And you can run studies in a much, much more cost efficient manner. Uh, and um, so uh, I'm going to show you some sample sizes here. So here's, here's uh, this is a classical way that we size trials. We say, with 80% power, I want to detect whether or not there's a signal. I want to get enough participants so that with 80% power, I can detect if there's a signal. However, I'll tolerate making an error and saying that there's a signal 5% of the time. That's, that's the way, uh, it's the traditional way you design studies. 
So this, so this is traditional. And then you also, because we, we're in this whole setting of availability, we have to anticipate whether or not people, what fraction of the time do you think people are going to be available? 70% of the time, 50% of the time, you know, a good bit of the time, they may not be available for our intervention. Uh, and then there's the signal to noise ratio that you want to detect. So in terms of the standard deviation of a step count, what kind of do I want to detect? 0.5 movement in standard deviations? or uh, 0.1 movement in standard deviations in step count. So that's what this is over here. And what you see is if you have uh, a pretty high availability and you have a standardized of, you want to detect even a 0.1 amount, a diff, you know, uh, 0.1 standard deviations change in uh, activity if you get a message versus if you don't, uh, you don't need that many participants only 33 participants. And this is really interesting. Um, first of all, these, if, these are very small standardized effect size, and it could be that we need to even look at smaller ones. But they accumulate over time, right? To the extent we can prevent habituation, and we use reinforcers like you were talking about earlier, uh, they would accumulate over time. So we can hope to have magnify our effect. Um, so that's cool. Uh, I just want to mention that when people, so we're, we're involved in a lot of, a number of studies where people want to run whole series of micro-randomized studies, and then to get to that warm start, and then do the online personalization. You have to be really careful when you do design these studies, you have to underestimate availability. So for example, if, if you think people are going to be available 70% of the time, but they're only available 50% of the time, that's not good for you. <laughs> you need to underestimate. Okay. Uh, a lot of data, this type of data can be used to form decision rules. And it's nice. You can use it to get your warm starts. Uh, I think I'll just go, this is some members of our team. I just want to indicate the interdisciplinary nature of these kinds of teams. I think this would be, you would be accustomed to this because you have a very interdisciplinary group. We have uh, behavioral scientists here. We have computer scientists. We have guys who do human-computer interaction, how you relate to the computer. We have statisticians. We have a sociologist. We have another behavioral scientist. Another, this guy works mainly only in wearables. Uh, so all of these people come together for you to run these kinds of studies and look for these signals. That's it. Thanks. <laughs>